I want to thank each person responsible for this educational event and for being uh, invited to participate. I hope what I've produced here for you will be helpful to each person here today. My topic is putting it all together, taking all the different value components of the Texas Longhorn breed and putting them together for a better profit for everyone that's producing these cattle. Texas Longhorn production is like reading a book. You don't just read the preface and feel like you've got everything in every chapter. It's a matter of using all the information you can get, learning as much about the breed as possible. So uh, we um, have put a bunch of things together here for you to look at today and uh, we think of these as tools. So the different virtues of the breed will help you put your tools together to do the job you need to do and you'll be totally equipped. So we're going to talk today about uh, the importance of disposition, different measuring calculations than you're used to, judging inside the animal, weighing, marketing color, marketing faces, early horn projections at one month of age, watching for the correct direction of early horn development, and marketing successfully using all the different virtues possible. We're going to talk about the methods of mating and what will work for you and your program. We want to talk today about getting it all together in the right way that will be profitable for each person here. One of the things that's happened in the past in this breed is single factor selection where people decide well they're going to take a a certain family of pure cattle and only breed that or a certain type of horn and only breed that. So single factor selection has been a problem and it hasn't worked profitable. We're going to talk today about the total package about the safest way to invest in this breed. At this time, there's hardly any pure families being bred profitably. So we are seeing the value in this breed is coming from mainly four original breeds and the blending of those. So follow along with us today, and we'll put all these pieces together and try to make some sense out of it. Thank you. Today, cattle that aren't gentle need to become hamburger. Therefore, disposition is the most important factor in registered Texas Longhorn cattle production. You can talk about horn, color, pedigree, but nothing as important as disposition when it comes to interacting with your cattle and your family. Here the governor of the state of Colorado leads a trail drive right down the middle of the city of Denver. It's important that these animals are under control and that they're smart. All you need is one idiot in this herd of steers and there's a stampede the governor will never forget. They need to be gentle in everything you do with them. Here's a, a horn measuring photo showing horns being measured with no shoot, nothing. Over 50 people measured this bull's horns and the lead rope was laying on the ground the whole time right within a few feet of some other show cattle. That's the kind of disposition that we need to have on these cattle because all kind of businessmen, women, children, grandparents are around these cattle. This is not the average Angus that runs through a sale barn and gets on a truck and goes to slaughter. This is a special family animal. Don't raise something that isn't safe. Measuring is very important each animal born in this place, our son Joel hog ties them the morning they're born. He puts an ear tag in their ear that has the name of the cow, the initial of the sire. He weighs the calf, gives them a selenium shot, takes a photograph on his uh, portable phone, and emails that directly to the office so we have a permanent record. The integrity of your pedigrees and of your data is the most important thing in the registered cattle business. You cannot raise registered cattle and not know who the sire or the dam or the birth dates and pertinent data is. Every animal ever raised on our ranch has a birth weight of record on our computer. At the TLMA horn measuring contest, they're measuring horns 
mostly tip to tip and every other way but we have other things that we're interested in we want to know about the confirmation we want to know about the size of the bulls and the height so Joel and I go around to the pins and we measure the second bar down from the top of the portable panels as to how far off the ground that is and you can sight across it and it will tell you what the height is on every bull that's being measured we want to know something besides their horn we want to know how big they are we want to know about their disposition and their conformation so you can sight across the pen make an allowance for any kind of hay that's in the pen that might change their height and you can come up with a height on every bull uh, within a half inch of a exactly correct we found that the horn uh, measuring last year there were some bulls as small as 54 inches tall and some were as tall as 63 inches tall when we measure cows we found that for every one inch in the Texas Longhorn breed of height where there's a variable on larger cows and smaller cows each one inch equals 55 pounds of weight so a cow that's 54 inches tall and a cow that's 56 inches tall the 56 inch tall cow will weigh 110 pounds more now I used to go around to prominent cattle shows and measure the cattle I measured the horn and we come up with a lot of data on horn measuring finally one day the Longhorn Association decided that um, I shouldn't be out messing with other people's cattle so they made a rule that if you didn't own the cattle you weren't allowed to touch them so I no longer went around the stalls and measured cattle but before they made that rule which I don't know if it's still enforced or not maybe it was just for me I came up with thousands of pieces of data for sampling as a result using the ratio of 100 for bulls we found that for the average bull in the breed the average cow measured a ratio of 118 and the average steer on tip to tip horn measured 156 so a steer actually has 56 percent more horn than a bull the same age so that's data that we were able to come up with that tells us something about um, measuring of horn and how they develop we also found in this calculation that we have a horn graph that we have put thousands of cattle on the graph we can take two different horn measurements six months apart and we can tell by the angle of the horn growth if the birth date is accurate up to about two weeks to a month in fact we found this to be more accurate than mouthing cattle so weights and measurements are very important if you listen to the college and universities they will tell you about ultrasound where they ultrasound the ribeye and you can learn by the ultrasound system how many square centimeters and how large the ribeye is on an animal well, Dr. Stuart Fowler at Berry College came up with data from years of research and he found that the forearm, right where it attaches to the body of a critter, is exactly the same circumference as the ribeye. So if you look at the forearm on the left and the forearm on the right, you'll see that one of them has a very small ribeye, one has a very large ribeye so you can watch an animal walk by a Texas Longhorn and you know without having ten thousand dollars worth of ultrasound equipment you you know which one has the largest ribeye so watch them when they walk by look at their forearm it's not that the forearm is an important part of the anatomy or a value cut on beef it's just that that's the clue to what the ribeye is many years ago in the late sixties this was a prominent bull in the longhorn industry he was well thought of he weighed around 1100 pounds and his horns measured 28 inches tip to tip I never heard anybody say that this bull didn't have enough horn I never heard anybody say that he didn't have enough body the, the deal was many of the other bulls were the same size so that's where the breed was 
1967. With careful weighing, measuring, and evaluations, uh, things have changed. And so as a result, with um, 10 and 15 generations of breed improvement, of measuring and weighing with horn measurements, weights, we now have cattle that weigh over a ton, our best bulls. We now have cattle that not only weigh over a ton, they have good disposition, pretty color, and this bull has 73 inches of tip-to-tip -tip horn. So today they're choices. We can put it all together. It doesn't have to be either breeding for horn or breeding for size or breeding for color. You can have the whole thing. How many of you here at the seminar today have a cattle scales that you can weigh your cattle on? How many people use it? How many people use the data to make selections concerning your future herd sires? By weighing cattle at birth and 205 days, you're going to know what they gain from their mother's milk in 205 days. So you can get a, a factor of how many pounds a day they gain. So when you weigh your calves around weaning time, six or seven months, you can adjust their days of age to 205 days and it allows you to evaluate every calf as to um, how fast it's growing in that period of time. It'll tell you how much milk the cow is giving and you'll know whether she's a good milking cow or just fair. So you can compare all your cattle. Now you can't necessarily compare yours to some other herd because they may have different kind of grass and different kind of a genetics but you can evaluate your own cattle and you can know which of yours are doing you the best job. When you weigh them at 365 days it shows if a critter has the ability to gain beyond the mother's milk. It eliminates the milk factor and starts putting it on the animal as to the genetics of gaining ability. So you can do an adjusted weight to 365 days and you compare every calf you weigh in your database, heifers, bulls, steers, whatever, and you'll find which ones are growing the fastest. We weigh every animal here on the ranch once, twice, or we got one bull now we're measuring him every, every 30 days. So the more data you can get, the better. You can buy cattle today from people that have data, or you can buy cattle from people who don't have data. But as we get in a more complicated and scientific world, people want data. They want to know the numbers of what is happening. Now one thing I do, which uh, I'd recommend anybody to do this, but we take uh, all of our young bulls that we're keeping for herd sires, and when they're 13 months old, just before we turn them out with the cows, or mostly with heifers on the little bulls, we measure the horn tip to tip on every bull and we weigh them. And we do a ratio at 13 months as to who has the widest horn spread tip to tip and who has the most weight at 13 months. So we put that on a list, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, through 60 or 70 or how many bulls we've got. And then if a bull is number one on horn, we look at where he is on weight, and he may be number six. So we add one to six, and we get a ratio of seven. Another bull may be tenth on horn, but first on weight. So we add ten and one, and we get a ratio of eleven. So as we go through our list, quite often we use for herd sires a bull with a, a score of maybe three or five or seven. And he may not be first, but he may be second on two of those factors. So that's not the end of the world, but it gives you two evaluation points. We also look at the pedigrees, the color, the disposition, uh, the confirmation, and is it the bloodline that we want to perpetuate in our herd. So it's just one way to calculate your numbers and do your own evaluation. Now color makes early calf cells happen. Color is visible before horn. Therefore, for marketing of young cattle, color is more important than horn. For instance, if you have a calf that's born snow white with a little bit of color on the ear, 
and a bull calf like this it's easy to assume that's a roper uh, somebody's going to buy him to train cutting horses and you're going to get not the market price you're going to get less than what he would bring by the pound from some other breeds a calf like this normally will weigh about 400 pounds at weaning time for us and uh, if you get four or five hundred dollars for them that's about the best we can consider but I know a lot of people are in areas where they just won't give that much and you may only get two or three hundred dollars so a white bull calf doesn't have a whole lot of value so you immediately see that you've lost money that year on your cow now here's a nice longhorn cow that had a lot of calves and she's back in a lot of pedigrees but when you see a cow with a white face like this immediately you think well maybe she's part Hereford now I doubt if this cow has any Hereford in her at all but if your public thinks she's got Hereford I would say never breed this cow to a bull with any white on the face breed her to a bull that has a totally dark head and try to breed away from this white so that's a way you can add some value to this cow's calves is never let her get bred to a bull with a white spackly face now if you got a pretty colored bull it's um, it's easy to sell them everybody wants them but if this bull had a white head and his whole head was white maybe just red ears his value would be less because the speckle face cattle sell better than the white headed cattle so those are values that when you're considering keeping a herd sire evaluate those things before you make a decision this is an exhibition steer that has most everything you want in an exhibition steer and he's got an ideal amount of white he's got some cleverly speckled markings around his face and that helps him to be a good exhibition steer he's got a pretty head and he's a very enjoyable lawn ornament so that zigzag splotchy color in the face will add dollars in your sales now in my opinion this is about as pretty of a heifer for color as I've ever seen she's black down on her legs and she's the tricolor that blends up into the red rusty color on top of the back so there's value in this color I've shown her to people and they see her a city block away and they say how much for that one they don't say how much horn does she have how much horn does her sire have they just say how much for that one so pretty colored cattle will sell themselves before weaning time people will pick them out and buy them and it's uh, also okay if their sire has over 80 inch horn that's good too now pale colors are easier to sell than white or solid red uh, but pale most people don't want to keep a pale light colored uh, bull no they don't like dishwater colors something that's not striking something that's not flashy so to create values in your cattle take a light pale cow like this who's a, a nice two-year-old cow breed her to a black bull with little specks on him and if you can turn her calf from being a pale light colored calf into a bright speckledy colored calf you've just had a tremendous amount of dollars to her progeny so I would say never breed a white bull or a red bull if you can afford better now if you can't afford anything but a red bull or a white bull and that's as good as you can do that's okay everybody's got to start someplace but I would recommend always have if you're gonna have a solid color bull make sure he has 20 to 30 percent white specks if you're gonna breed a bull that's mostly white make sure he has 10 to 20 percent dark specks if you never breed white or never breed red you won't have a continual frequency of just plain red and plain white calves in your herd about 60 percent dark color is the most value color it reduces your frequency of whites and reds if you go by this rule the darker the colors the better and the more specks the better the faster you'll sell your calves I don't have any specs this bull has but his calves are some of the fastest selling on the place and he is not our biggest horn bull he's gonna just barely creep over 70 but his calves are the ones that get picked out as young calves the quickest this is probably about as good a color for marketing 
as we know of. People like brindles, they like speckles, they like little specks. So he's got the white specks and stripes on him. He's got the gold and the red and the dark brown brindle. So it doesn't hurt that he's over 80 inches, but that color in itself gives you uh, several shots at raising a pretty calf. Now this heifer has a nice straight back with black splotches and tr a very trim underline. People see a heifer this color way off in the distance. So this is the kind of color that's easy to sell. If you add these bright small speck colors with the dark tones to them in your genetics, you'll find marketing becomes a lot easier. This is an example of the whole thing. Nice horn, nice conformation, correct udder, dark small specks. So this is a tough market today. We've got to put all of it together in one package to make it profitable. So we have a, a politically corrupt nation where our politicians are always disappointing us. So we've got to use every tool we can for our family to make our businesses work and we need to make our longhorn production as profitable as we can. So let's talk about horn planning. This is not the same as a tape measure. It's not just about the tape, it's about the shape. Now this heifer has horns shaped exactly correct. This is a Fiesta Fanny clone. It's about 14 or 15 months old. And most of you have seen her at the horn measurings and she's uh, in the low 80 inch range, tip to tip. But genetics are your first phase of growing great horns. If you don't have the genetics that will give you horn growth and start out with this angle of the lateral horn and the horn growing slightly back, you will not get the really big horn cattle. So start out by filling your pedigrees with 70 and 80 inch horned genetics. When you get to a show and you find your cattle aren't near enough horn to win, you can't go out in the pens and stretch the horns at that point. It's just too late. You've got to plan these things in advance. Now one way to plan in, in advance is to look at your small calves. Look at your baby calves and look at the horn buttons really close. Now this is an average horned longhorn calf at about one month old. The horn tips are kind of round, not as blunt as your thumb, uh, not sharp like a pencil. But if they were pointed like a little pencil, it would pretty much convince you that the horn growth was not going to be very good. So notice the base and the size of the horns on your calves as they start to develop. Now you see the base on this calf, see the blunt tip, it's as blunt as a banana. And when you see the big base and the big tip, and, this, and a calf is only a month old, you know that there's going to be a lot of horn here. So take a look at that, think about the other calf, and see what you think that one's going to develop. Well. To speed up about five years, this is the mature steer. He's five years old now and he has 95 inch horn. So you know what he looked like when he was a baby. And when you see that kind of horn buds on your calves, you'll know that you're gonna get a lot of horn. This is the right angle for the horn. All of your over 80 inch cattle start with the lateral flat horn with the backward slope. When a calf is three to five months old, you're going to know where the horns are going and what direction. If they're going straight out or going forward, you know you're not going to get an 80 inch horned animal. They've got to go back to start out. Here's Shadow Jubilee, who's 88 inches tip to tip. Now notice the angle of how the horn comes out of her head, goes flat out, down just a little bit, and back. So if you're going to get a wide tip-to-tip -tip measurement, this is the direction the horn has to start out. This is non-negotiable. There's no other choices. This cow is going to be 90 inches by the time she's 13. And when she gets to her uh, uh, seasoned years, I don't like to use the word se uh, senior citizen, but her seasoned years, there's a good chance she'll have 93 to 95 inch horn. That won't be um, 
a difficult thing in just a few years ahead. It, it can happen with the real good horn genetics. So we're honored to have raised this cow, but that's the direction the horn has to go. Years ago, we had a lot of cattle like this, and I go to some sales and I still see them. They're everywhere. But this is the old traditional type longhorn. The horns grew out, went straight up, and didn't go hardly any place. But there's thousands of cows like this. You see the size of her forearm. You know that her rib eye is no bigger than her forearm. She's just a plain, ordinary cow. You can outcross her. You can put her with a Charlet bull or something like that and you add some muscle to her. But as a cow with value in the longhorn industry, she has virtually no value beyond what her hamburger is worth. We had to start out with these kind of cattle, but we don't have to continue to mess with them. So when you take a tape measure and you measure your cattle, if your tape measure, like on the upper picture here, shows that your tape could go straight across tip to tip and not even touch the animal's head, that means the horns are already too high. The picture at the bottom shows that a tape measure has to bend over the top of the head to reach the horn tips. That's the right angle. The longer your cattle can go in age, like two to four years old, and the tape measure not go straight across their head so the horns are low enough that the tape has to bend, you will get more good solid measurement on your cattle that way than any other way. This one at the top, he's already over. He's not going to make it. And I went to a cattle show a few months ago, and I couldn't find a single animal in the show that had the low horns like the one at the bottom. What it told me was every animal in that class of those bulls was going to be a, oh, a 40 or a 35 or maybe a 48 inch because their horns are going to go up, they're going to bend forward, and they're going to have very little longhorn value. So make sure your tape measure bends over the top of the head. Now this is a popular horn measurement today. People like their horns to grow straight out like a yardstick or a pencil or a toothpick. And that measures really good. If an animal grows really straight horn, the tip to tip grows out there really quick. And they're more likely to win horn classes with a straight out horn with no shape whatsoever. That's popular, and it's probably going to get to be more numerous all the time as cattle that win are bred to cattle that win that have these very, very straight horns that go straight out to the side. Now, I would personally prefer, like this two-year-old heifer, you'll notice her horn is very lateral, and she has a backward twist, and although the horn starts growing forward and up right out of the head, She's made a complete turn and now the tips of her horns are going down in the summer as a two-year-old. So by the time she's a five-year-old, that will curl some more and her corkscrew, will, those tips will be back going upward and she'll have a complete turn from the horn shape that she first started out with. This is more desirable to most people to have some twist and yet it's a compromise where the horns are very straight and you see here that the tape measure would have to bend over the head uh, to be measured. So that means you're going to get everything you're going to get out of this cow when you measure her. You're going to get the best values and you're going to make the most money with your cattle uh, as you go by these rules. This is a true corkscrew horn cow. The word corkscrew means a thread. And here's a thread that you could run your finger down the thread underneath this cow's horn. So that's what a corkscrew is supposed to look like. It gets so twisty that the horn itself actually becomes oval at the base instead of round. As you look out to the middle or the end of her horn, her horn is round. And you look at the base of her head and it becomes a long oval. So this is a corkscrew and it's very desirable. Uh, this is very popular for sales, but they don't normally measure good because they go so twisty that they don't get the good tip to tip of the toothpick type cattle. Today a thick base is getting more popular. Most people do not have a source of really thick horn so they're not acknowledging that it has a that it is a value trait. But it is 
if the tip to tip is enough just having a big bass or a horn that goes up in the air or some direction is not exactly good enough but if you can get a really good tip to tip and some good bass well then that will create some dollar value to your program now let's talk about marketing Texas Longhorn cattle are the sports model in entertainment Texas Longhorns are the most flamboyant they're the best riding steers they're easy to market and especially market privately Dickinson Cattle Company sells and buys privately it is a personal thing to do business whereby at auction often the seller or buyer may never meet when great cattle are sold it is a joy to become friends with the new buyer problem cattle might to the contrary be sold at auction where the seller really doesn't want to meet the buyer auctions don't normally announce the name of the buyer or the name of the seller therefore many times the seller doesn't even know who bought their cattle and the buyer may not know who produced the cattle some people like that but personally I feel auctions are impersonal and tend to reduce prices I like to look people in the eye that are buying cattle from us I like to talk to them about the cattle and I like to make buying cattle a good personal experience those are just my opinions but that's what's worked for us we find it's economical to sell privately it's also economical to buy privately one way to add marketing value is by training riding steers keep in mind we don't have a competitor in the world on riding steers no one will be driving Angus cattle down the main street of Denver no governor is going to be riding a Palomino horse with a smile on his face in front of a herd of herpers. They're going to use Longhorn cattle for these exhibitions. We can offer this as a sales niche that no other breed has. I contend that the Texas Longhorn breed is the easiest breed of cattle to sell. There are so many directions you can go. So in a tough economy, we've got to take a look at all of these different tools for marketing ability now let's look at breeding methods here's a cow that's been used in all four of the breeding methods she's 88 inches tip to tip she's pictured here as just a 10 year old and she's been natural serviced for about eight years of her life sometimes she was artificially inseminated and sometimes uh, she's been flushed for embryos at one time she was used for clone production and having dealt with these four types of breeding natural AI embryo transfer and cloning we have had our most success with natural service with natural breeding we've had our most economical breed improvement with artificial insemination embryos sometimes have been profitable sometimes it's been quite expensive and on the cloning although somewhat controversial to some people I have not found for sure that very many people have ever made a profit from cloning of Texas Longhorns at most only one or two people have ever made a profit with cloning Texas Longhorns some very excellent cattle have been the result but the cost has been very high on AI for instance there's thousands of people that have benefited by the profit from artificial insemination they can buy semen from twenty five to fifty dollars on the top bulls in the breed and artificially breed mediocre foundation type cows and they've got a chance to have rapid improvement in their first time around so clones are fascinating it's exciting this is the first eight clones from Shadow Jubilee. Now let me tell you, when we saw these calves in the pen at the cloning facility, it'll make your heart stop a couple beats because they're absolutely awesome. And this was a thrill to us. But let me tell you, the cost per pound of that little bunch of heifers there was big. So it may be something you can afford, something you like, but we won't be doing any more cloning because of the expense. We get wonderful things to happen with embryo and we get economical great things to happen with AI 
We encourage people to work to put it all together. This is a cow that's just four years old. She's uh, in her mid-70s, tip to tip, and 1,200 pounds. She's a natural service result. She's not cloned, she's not embryo. She's just born the old-fashioned way. So most of the really great cows that you know about in the nation are natural service, and very few are, are AI, less are embryo, and only 100 or so are clones. This is what we think putting it all together is about. This cow is seven years old, over 1,200 pounds and 83 inches tip to tip. We think she is a total and complete cow that's got it together. These genetics are available in the industry today. We don't have to go backwards to the old historical cattle with the 30 or 28 inch or even 40 inch horn. We don't have to go back to the red ones and the white ones. We can put it all together. And in a depressed and negative uh, national market, we've got to use every tool in the toolbox to be profitable.